Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for this time, and, and we do thank you for the blessings of, of um, we're so connected right here, Lord, to, to three babies that's just born just, just recently, and uh, Lord, and everything is, is going so well with them, and Lord, and, and all these, these and I just think about these three babies, and they're, they're, they've all been born into Christian homes, Lord, and, and homes that, that is just about nurturing them and, and, and showing them as they grow the love of Jesus Christ. And, and Lord, it's just, <laughs> it's overwhelming. It really is, Lord. And we're just thankful for that. And Lord, but it also, it also reminds us of those who, who do not have that, that kind of favor, Lord. And we pray for them as well and that, that we can be an influence to those children somewhere down the line. We thank you for uh, those who are in children's church right now and, and, and our volunteers who volunteer to do that, Lord. And I know it takes a little time and a little effort, but man, it's all worth it. Lord, we just, um, we just love you so much and just ask for your, your guidance and your help today as we get into the word and as we study this morning, Lord, that as always, that you teach, Lord. May you always increase as I decrease because it's all about you. Lord, we just thank you so much, Jesus. In your most precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, well, uh, did, you, uh, did you bring some examples today about spiritual warfare that you've noticed? That was my challenge to you last week. And uh, if you could come up with maybe a few examples of, of, that you recognized of, of, of spiritual warfare, and it's what we've been talking about, and um, either on the news, locally, in your own home, I don't know, something, and not always negative, it's, it's good things too. Good things happen in spiritual warfare as well. Any, anybody? Teachers, is this the way you felt? Hey, Jane's back there. All right. Yes, Jane. I know some a special from CNN about how they brought a bomb out or whatever and showed how it was used and all that stuff, and that was just kind of unusual to see on nationwide TV. How to, how, how to detonate a bomb, huh? No, I had, a bomb or whatever. Oh, oh, I, I know the story you're talking about. Bong. Yeah. A bong. Okay. A yes, a marijuana bomb. Okay. Okay. All not to use a bomb. And how they're all, uh, I guess the states decide that you can have not just medical marijuana, but the, recreational marijuana. Right, a, right. Federal Absolutely. Um, I'm a big Fox News fan, but um, if you watch the Greg Gutfeld's last name, uh, Greg Gutfeld, sometimes his show can get bleeped a few times, and I wasn't used to seeing that when I was growing up. Right, right. But on the positive side, you see where um, it seems like we're more open, at least we'll talk about how important it is to say Merry Christmas to each other. Okay. And um, not to cause any problems, but it seems like if you watch a lot of the commercials, a lot of the commercials to me are trying to kind of um, show you different aspects of life that maybe certain people believe in, but not. The very politically correct. Yes. Directed well, commercials. Too, so. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Jane. Anybody else? The thing that I've been uh, noticing this week is just um, back in history and, of course, today, the uh, disregard for, for human life, whether it be okay. a child, whether it be a female, whether it be someone of a different race, okay. that people that throughout history have used people like commodities, like uh, absolutely. Um, they devalue life, and uh, it's really sad. Okay, absolutely part of spiritual warfare, I believe. Anybody else? Anybody else? I had two things, and it goes along with, actually, it's interesting. I, I brought two things with me that goes along exactly with both of you, the things that you had mentioned. Number one was, and I used them as the new year. Since we're in the new year, things that happened for the new year, 2018, come in to place uh, legalization of marijuana in California. It's not the first state that legalized recreational marijuana, but, uh, but it's just an example. Remember what we talked about last week about the drip, about immorality is like water and it just kind of drips and you don't think anything about the drip. It's kind of like the, 
the stuff we see on TV anymore like Jane was talking about. But, but we remember, and we talked about it, whenever there was that talk about legalizing marijuana in, in, in any state, before it was legalized in any state, and it was about medicinal purposes. You know, it was all about, um, uh, you know, everybody had a big heart. Remember what we said last week? Remember what we said last week? What I said last week in the sermon that, that if we grow up in a society that, that we are indoctrinated with the gospel of political correctness, what happens then? We become adults that do immoral things thinking that we are doing moral things. And, and so we are legalizing a drug like marijuana in states because it's a good thing. We're going to help people. It's all about helping people and all about helping people with their illnesses and all that. We knew where it was going to go, didn't we? We knew exactly where this drip was going to go. It was going to go to rec legalizing recreational marijuana. And, then that, and now what's next? Is it going to stop at marijuana? Is it? It ain't going to stop marijuana. It's going to keep going. So, so that is, I, I, I certainly believe that that is uh, a case of spiritual warfare. It's happening. It's more than just man's effort for these things come fall into place. And number two, and I may, I may step on some toes with the last one. I may step on some toes with this one. That's the thing about spiritual warfare. And we talk about social issues. It gets personal. And, and this one, in the state of Illinois, 2018, in divorce court now, they are going to treat the family pet, much like a child. They are going to give visitation rights to the family pet. Now, why, do, why would I say that that is spiritual warfare, a sign of spiritual warfare? Why, why, would, why would I say that? What happens whenever we treat, and it's funny that Jim and I were talking about this the other day, whatever happens when we treat animals like human beings? We devalue human life, just as Ginger. Ginger already hit it on the head. We devalue human life when we treat animals like human beings. We do not elevate animals. We devalue humans. And then when we devalue human life, it becomes much easier to call that unborn baby a fetus and get rid of it. It becomes much easier to overlook sexual trafficking. It becomes much easier to, to, to accept immorality when we devalue human life and we don't even realize we're doing it. Yeah, Absolutely. Absolutely. And, this does, and, and our question is this, and I've got, I still got a lot to do today. Our question is this, did these things just happen by man's effort or was there more to it than that? Is there a spiritual warfare happening that's causing these things to slowly drip, seep into our lives? Yeah. <laughs> we like to have fun with millennials sometimes at their expense. Um, but I'm afraid, I'm afraid that's, that's funny, and it was meant to, uh, meant to be funny, but um, I'm afraid that the, whenever we look at the millennial generation and, uh, and we see these things, and, but the, the, the problem is, is that when we ask the question, who raised them? <laughs> we ask the question, uh, uh, who raised them? The joke isn't quite so funny anymore. It's uh, who spoiled them? Who made them feel like uh, they were winners whenever they lost? Who judged it necessary to go into debt just so you could give them everything they wanted? Who didn't teach them the art of personal relationships? And now it's not quite so funny anymore. Because uh, they are a result of, um, of the way they were raised. Oh, I'm, I'm speeding through this. 
Um, today I want to talk about, I basically want to talk about baby boomers and millennials. We, we do have a generation in between. Baby boomers are those that are born, this is basic numbers, basically between 1946 and 64. I just made it in. I was born in 1964. A generation X is 1965 to 1980, and millennials are those that was born 1981 to the year 2000. And, um, and I know that it's not right and it's not fair to just label a group of people because of the time they were born and say that everybody in this group is the same. Actually, what I think when we watch that video, I think probably the, the more frustrated people are the millennials who are not like that. And, but they know people their age that are, and they're like, man, look what they're doing to our generation. But, <clears throat> again, we have to look at, <laughs> I'm afraid, is, uh, is who labeled them. So I'm not going to, to I, I don't really want to put everybody in this, in this box if you were born in this generation. And I, and I definitely don't want to just throw blame at one group or, or one group of people because there are exceptions to the rule. But as I talked about last week, I desire to better understand our society. And, uh, and our society is constantly taking shape around us. I want to look at the things that um, are forming popular opinions and those things that are becoming, and as, I, as we have already talked about, the scary thing is the things that are becoming acceptable. It's okay. And if our, life, if, if our life in our society was like a sentence that read from left to right, the millennial generation would be on the left side of it, and they would be, they would be forming the context, the design, the emphasis, and the emotion of this sentence. And us baby boomers... We would be on the far right side. We're, we're, we're so busy managing a structured and predictable conclusion and exit. It seems like it's what we're so, um, so concerned about. And I'll, I'll get myself in trouble since we're, we're, always, we're always videotaping these things. <laughs> but, but, you know, sometimes when I'm with circles of pastors and they're my age or older, you know, what, you know what, most of the time what they're talking about instead of how are we going to reach people for Christ and how are we going to grow our churches, well, I've only got this many years and I'm going to be able to retire and I'm going to hopefully get this and I'm going to do this. And, you know, they're talking about the exit in life. And I'm sorry, sometimes I want to say, are you still in ministry? Or Anyway, anyway we're not going to go there. But, <laughs> but that's, unfortunately, that's the way we, that's the way we think. Um. So, how does all of this relate to spiritual warfare? What I really want to concentrate on is, is the effects over time. If, if this false or, or, or relative wisdom becomes accepted by the next generation, we're going, you know, what What happens? What, how's, that, how's that saying go? You may have to help me. What, what, what one generation tolerates, the next generation accepts. Is that how that goes? And it's very true. And, it, and it's this drip, this constant drip that we talk about that happens over time. And I want to use millennials this morning as our example. Just as the video shows that millennials have a reputation of being spoiled, lazy, unfocused, entitled, and not able to deal with stress. And their greatest desire is to have purpose and meaning, although they don't truly really understand what that means or, or, or really even how to achieve it. So then, so then why is there such a, and I think, such a spiritual battle for the millennials? Because if you're searching for purpose, and you don't know how to achieve it. If you're searching for purpose and meaning and you don't know how to achieve it, Satan is definitely wanting to be there telling you how. Okay? And that's why we have got to be there as well. Telling them what purpose and meaning, where to find true purpose and meaning in life. Now, I don't want to be too negative about millennials, by the way. Millennials are also an amazing group of people. There is no other generation that is more educated than millennials. 
There is no other generation that, that, has more, that has those kind of skills, maybe not so much physical skills, but those kind of skills that, that this generation could do anything with the right direction. Very intelligent generation. Of course Satan would want them. Now I'm a believer that everybody is responsible for their own actions. However, most people are just a reflection of the lessons they acquired when they were growing up. I mean, it just comes right down to it. As, as we have these new parents here, and new parents, guess what's going to happen in time? You're going to be talking to your kids, and you're going to go, oh, my mom said that. My dad said that. You know, it's just like that commercial. Remember that commercial I showed, and you're turning into your parents? It happens because of these lessons that we learn when we're young. So I think it only makes sense to understand the conduct of the millennial. We must look at the parenting skills of the baby boomer. Okay? So we're just, we're just getting all of us involved. And Gen X is, 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 um, is involved in there some too. Unfortunately, many times during the, the parenting skills that are acquired are, are what? They're the, the, the popular opinion. The popular opinion at the time. For example, again, we're going to talk about these babies. How should you lay a newborn baby when it sleeps? On its back, on its side, on, a, on its belly. How many times since, since, since my kids were, were babies? I don't know how many times that has changed. And I think it changed between Daniel and Curtis. And they're only a few years of difference. But it just changed. So, but what do we do? I mean, we're, we're so terrified of, of, of SIDS that, that whatever that popular opinion is, we're, we're going we're to go there. We're going to try it because we, we, we definitely don't want anything to happen to our babies. Well, unfortunately, this happens in our parenting skills as well. How many times, oh boy, I'm, I'm trying to get through this. How many times has... has have you seen on the news, well, this government study said that parents should do this. I mean, isn't that a red light? It's a government study, so maybe, <laughs> you know, <laughs> maybe you should look at it a little differently. Um, some examples of this relative wisdom or, or popular opinion about parenting was to tell your children that they can be anything that they want to be, regardless of effort. They are special because of who they are not because of what God has made them. Grades and advancements in school became subject to the demands of parents. Not that the parents demand that the children earn the grades, but they be rewarded the grades because of the parents. Children receive participation awards even if they come in last. And in some cases... No one even knows who's first because you're not allowed to keep score. All this, why, why, why do we do all of this? All of this was done to protect the self-esteem of the child. And when it, when it, and in reality, when it's all accomplished, it devalues the award. It devalues the accomplishment. And that person who put in extra effort to achieve a noticeable accomplishment it devalues their self-esteem. It damages their self-esteem. And also, it is humiliating to be patronized. And that child receiving the, re the award for coming in last knows that they don't deserve it. They come in last. They know they don't deserve that award. So again, these, these skills that was developed to, to promote the self-esteem of a child does nothing but the opposite the self-esteem becomes compromised. Now, when these children, as we talked about last week, when these children who receive these, this, these, this, this damaging poison, I call it, <laughs> this uh, politically correctness poison, and, and, and they grow up with it. These, these, these failed policies, this, this terrible polo the philosophy, I cannot talk, I'm trying to go through this so fast, becomes adults and they realize, you know what? They're not so special after all. They're not, as special, they're not so special as, as anyone else. And their parents no longer 
have the power to demand promotions and advancements in their jobs. They don't have that power to do that. And they soon learn that, you know what, if I don't work, I don't get paid. And you know what, I may even lose my job. And, and, and homes and cars and vacations and, and, and maybe even the necessities in life such as clothes and food, they're not possessed just because I want them. And for many in this generation, reality comes crashing down. Reality comes crashing down. And the very thing that the parents that followed the wisdom of the age set out to do worked absolutely the opposite. These things were meant to protect self-esteem. But in, real, in reality, self-esteem is not something to be protected, but developed through challenges in life. It's not something that, self-esteem is not something that you just you have it's something that is and and think about this parents if you have young children self-esteem is something that is developed and grown and it's nurtured and it comes most of the time from from learning how to work through the struggles and the hard things and and the failures and and you know ask ask any professional um athlete did they learn more from the games they won or the games they lost games they lost expecting favor because of who I am instead of what I've done is a failed policy it's been taught to millennial the millennial generation and now my question today is this did this did this idea of expecting favor Without working for it. Was that just a man-made thing or was there more to it than that? Was there a spiritual warfare going on? Is Satan trying to, trying to teach a generation that, you know what, you, you can have reward without sacrifice? You know, something about this sounds familiar. Where have I heard this before? Could it be that the temptation of receiving favor without sacrifice may not be a new concept? Maybe this might have something to do with spiritual warfare. You see, the commander of the world's evil army had an opportunity one time like no other. His, he was able to face his adversary, his number one adversary in the flesh. And the key word, the flesh. The flesh that is weak. The flesh that could be tempted. If he could bring Christ down, the world would be his. And, and, and understand this. Whenever Jesus faced Satan, and we call it the temptation of Jesus in the Bible, that, that all Satan needed was one sin. All Satan needed was, was for Jesus to have one weak moment. That's it. Just one. And then mankind would no longer have a perfect sacrifice for the atonement of their sins. Mankind would no longer have somebody to fulfill that law as we've been talking about. Just one sin is all he needed. So, whenever, whenever Satan faced Jesus in the flesh, I don't know about you, but I think he was bringing his A game. Don't you think so? So what did he do? Matthew 4, 1 through 4. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, afterward he was hungry. Now when the tempter came to him, he said, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Remember, the human body of Jesus had a need. And that's an understatement. 
Folks, he'd been, he'd been fasting for 40 days and 40 nights, okay? It was more than in need. I believe that Jesus was in agony. He was hungry. 40 days? You guys are wondering what's for, you guys are wondering right now what's for lunch and how long am I going to keep you here before you can go eat lunch? Right? Come on. 40 days and 40 nights. He was hungry, and old Satan approached him and said, you know what, because you are the Son of God, I can smell the bread already. Woo, it's good. You can make the best bread out of these rocks. Just do it. Just do it. Now, what we have to understand is why. Why would it have been so disastrous for Jesus to turn those rocks into bread? You see, the fast and the hunger had a purpose. And to have taken matters in his own hands would have been selfish. It would have been prideful because he could do it. Also, it would have been disobedient because God was going to provide for him. God did provide for him, but it was not the time. Satan presents the temptation to expect favor because of who Jesus is. Now, let me ask you this question. What if Satan were to ask you this question? If you are the parents of this child, then make sure you protect them Protect it from, and I should have said, from all the struggles in life. If you are the parent of this child, then make sure you protect it from all the struggles in life. Now, now what's wrong with that? What's wrong with that statement? That sounds like a good statement, doesn't it? That sounds like maybe something Jesus would say, right? What's so wrong with that statement? What's wrong with turning rocks into bread? I believe that over-parenting is evidence of spiritual warfare. And when I say over-parenting, I'm talking about this. I'm talking about about doing everything for your children and not letting them experience no. And believe me, I I know why we don't say no. And by the way, this doesn't apply to grandparents, okay? It doesn't apply to grandparents. I'm talking to parents. They need to know what no means. They need to know what what struggle means. They need to learn how to get through it. Because it has a point and it has a purpose. And when you do this, it, 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 it teaches them how to cope under pressure. It teaches them how to have self-esteem. Not by saying, oh, don't let my baby hurt any, any at all, any way. I don't want my baby's feelings to be hurt in any way. Because if it does, it's going to damage their self-esteem. That's not true. It's not true. It is, it is a false philosophy that Satan is trying to teach you. Why do I say this? Let me tell you about the millennial generation as they have become adults. Suicide and accidental overdose from drug rates are constantly rising in this age group. Why? Because they can't cope. Because they can't cope. Why, why do you think wine sales right now are greater than it's ever been? Because we just make the best wine ever? It's because millennials has got to have it. They've got to have it. They've got to have that release. My day has been too hard, so I've got to have something to release. I don't know how to deal with it. I should have it because I want it. Credit card debt. Credit card debt is like no other right now. It's out of control. Credit card's a way to get it because I want it. Difficulty in keeping a job. 
Employers refuse to be their parents. Why would, why would all this be a ploy of Satan? Why would Satan want this generation to be in need and in and, and, and need because they don't have the self-esteem to know how to deal with things, know how to cope with things. Why would Satan want them there expecting that I should receive reward without sacrifice? Because people, people are much easier to deceive and lead and manipulate if they struggle with self-independence. That's exactly where Satan wants you. Guys, you can come on up. Okay. I have spent the last 30 minutes or so um, pinpointing a problem. Now, what do we do to help heal the damage? What do we do? It isn't going to help anything to point her finger and say, you know, they're like this. It doesn't, it doesn't help anything to say, well, yeah, you know, we, we probably made some mistakes as parents, but <laughs> I'm not, it's all over now. My kids are grown. Well, so what, what, what do we do? As I said last week, prayer is such, it is such an important tool in spiritual warfare. Man, we need to pray like we're attacking these problems. We need to pray like we talked about in Sunday school today, the, the, the confidence that the Christian should have. We, if we are Christ, we've got Christ behind us. We have got the power of God behind us. And we need to pray that way with that kind of confidence. Self-esteem of the Christian is a problem. True ministry is found on the battleground, not in some board meeting. It is found in the battleground. Just some examples, and these are just some examples. Babysitting. That may sound very simple, may not sound like much of a ministry, but you know what? Young parents struggle, especially if they're, they're working, especially if they're working two jobs, and sometimes they're just working one job. Uh, they struggle. They need, they need a break once in a while. And you know what? You like kids. You're trustworthy. Think about the babysitting that you could do for people once in a while. Somebody in your church. Or maybe just, maybe you could babysit right here in the nursery. And, and so that somebody can just sit and listen. Get involved with your youth and younger ministries. Just, just go. Learn as you go. You don't, have to, you don't have to say, well, that's not really my, you know, my gifting. That's not. Just go and learn. Lead a fundraiser that teaches to work for what you receive. Cindy's not here right now, but when Cindy was leading the youth, and that's when my kids were in the youth, and, and I, I helped out, and I always told Cindy, I said, Cindy, I am not going to be part of a fundraiser where you stand on the street and beg for money. I will not have, I will not have any part of it. And I don't know, I may be stepping on somebody's toes, and I think they're pretty effective, actually, those kind, but you need to work for what you get. I so believe that. And that's what we need to be teaching our children, that you work for what you get. Lead a Bible study geared toward parents. Look for places where you can just simply be that Christian example and influence kids. And these are just some, just, just small, they're just small things. But this is how we fight spiritual warfare. Sometimes I feel, I think we, we, when we hear that, that term, spiritual warfare, we, we feel like it's something out there that we can't really engage in. And it's, you know, no, it's people. It's, it, 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 it's having relationships. It's teaching the next generation. It's mentoring. It's discipleship. There are so many 
terms, but it's being engaged with the message of Jesus Christ. All of us can do it. All of us can fight. All of us can be a part of it. And these guys just come back. They just come back from somebody fighting spiritual warfare in the next building. And you can too. So I just want to challenge you. And and again, I want to challenge you for next week as well. Bring those examples. (coughs) Bring those examples of what you see as spiritual warfare happening around you. And the effects of, of what spiritual warfare has done. I want to hear them. Bring them next week. And let's talk about them. And I just want to challenge you. Where can you get engaged and involved in this battle? You're not going to take on the world. You're not going to get in the middle of the street and start shouting. That's, that's not going to be it. That's not how we do this. It's by helping your neighbor. It's by helping that person sitting next to you. It's by being Christ to the world. Not good intentions. Believe me, I have so many intentions that I get covered up with intentions. It's doing. So that's my challenge for you this morning. And and, and as I open up the um, altar this morning, come, come. And fight the spiritual warfare. You know something that's in your heart right now. You know something that's in your heart right now that you're dealing with. Or that somebody that you know is dealing with. Let's attack it. Okay? Come if you will.